So for the benefit of the video and for the people here, I wanted to just introduce you really quickly. And I'm going to try to go in order. Down here is Heather DeGram. Um, she got a BSW, I mean a BSN in nursing in 2006 and then an MSN in leadership in uh, 2008. And then a PhD in nursing science in 2017. She's an assistant professor. Um, all of her nursing degrees were earned online. And now she teaches in an online program here, right? Right here. So um, she can really address what that's been like, maybe in a way that other people don't have quite similar experiences. And then next uh, to her is Kenneth Urban. Is that how you say your name? That's, that's exactly right. I am so glad about that. <laughs> He's got a uh, master's in public administration. He got that last just last May. He's also an assistant fire, the assistant fire chief in the Corpus Christi Fire Department. Um, and a fun fact about him is that he's a certified personal trainer, and he competed in his first bodybuilding competition last July. Congratulations. Ooh. Yeah. They like to get fun facts. <laughs> in, do you pronounce your name Jorge? Fonseca uh, or George? George? George Fonseca. He has an MBA in uh, general business, um, 2017, from here. Um, he's a financial analyst, too, here at the university, so he works here as, as well. And he ran his first 5K in September and placed third. Oh, wow. And he plans on running at least once a month throughout the year, right? So... We've got fitness in the air here. <laughs> and then we have Edith Montemayor. She has an MA in clinical psychology that you got in 2011, correct? And she's a licensed specialist in school counseling, which is um, in school psychology, pardon me, um, which is one of the things that the uh, master's degree here can prepare people for. She earned, uh, this would be kind of a fun fact for somebody in her field, a Bachelor of Arts degree in dance as well as psychology at the University of Texas in Austin. So, oh. dance therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and then down here on this end is Angela Speaker. Angela has a BA in communication from 2007. You received that here, right? And then she has an MS in Counseling, uh, 2012. She's now the Senior Academic advice, uh, Advisor at TMUCC in the College of Education and Human Development. So, a fun fact about her is that every full-time and part-time position she's had has been at this university, except for six months when she worked for a private high, as a private high school teacher and she quickly came back here <laughs> to the Island University and says that higher education is definitely her calling. So yeah. these are your panelists, all people who have degrees from here, all who have uh, gone on and um, are working in their fields or closely related fields where th their degrees make a difference for them. So I'm going to direct some questions and then... We'll just go from there. And as there's time, raise your hand or whatever if you have specific questions, okay? That's it? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, the first thing I'd like to know, and instead of splitting this up into like 10 or 15 minute segments where we cover everything, I want to ask one question at a time. Does that work for you? Right. Yeah. Okay. So... Tell us just a little bit about your uh, your position and what it entails and how you got to this place. And I know some of you may be really new in your positions, and so the story may be shorter, but how'd you, how'd you get here? So I started as a student worker for the Executive Vice President of Finance and Administration 
here at the university when I was doing my uh, bachelor's in accounting. And from that, I kind of developed some relationships, uh, met a couple of the directors, and ultimately the director of budgets contacted me after I had graduated and had left already to be a credit analyst at a bank and said, we have an opening, you should apply, you have all the skills, and I did, and lo and behold, I ended up back here and have been now three years with the budget office there as a financial analyst. Uh, one, and then I just became a two recently, uh, just because of the three years of experience now. And essentially what I do is I use numbers to budget for the university-wide uh, funds. Mm -hmm. So all the money we receive has to be allocated correctly. It needs to, we need to pay our, our vendors, all that type of stuff. I make sure that that money is available for departments to spend and that we do have that money actually available mm -hmm. that from the, we receive from tuition. And that's a bulk of what I do. It, you started as a student worker, yeah. an undergraduate student that night. Correct. And finance, business, what? Uh, in a, for my bachelor's, it was a, in a accounting. In accounting, okay. So that's why it's particularly. Yeah. 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 If we had a fan, we could set that up. And that right. um, so do you think that working on campus as a student worker, in an area that, especially that maybe it's related to your field or an office that was related to your field, made a difference? I definitely do. Uh, I think without that opportunity, without seeing it firsthand and actually interacting with the, that type of data, uh, just the money aspect of it, which was really interesting to me, especially doing accounting, mm -hmm. that really opened the door of where I wanted, what I wanted to do with my career, mm -hmm. not just at the moment, what I was doing was more, I saw the, the, the path I could be taking mm -hmm. and ultimately reach. And I think I'm a couple of steps further into it now than anyone else is doing worker, but ultimately I'd like to be you know, director of, mm -hmm. of budgets. So that student worker position definitely helped guide me to, to that. Right there. Thank you. Somebody else tell us about your... My uh, trajectory is pretty similar, actually, with the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. When I was an undergrad, I got the opportunity to be a student assistant and got to go out in the field. They had a grant, and I got to go out in the field and actually work in, at the MHMR for a certain amount of time. We had a project that we were working on. And so I agree, it kind of, for me, opened doors to get to know the faculty on a, on a more personal level. And so I did that during my undergrad. And then when I was working on my master's, I was a teaching assistant as well. So I, I got to actually be in the classroom with the faculty and, and work as a teaching assistant when I was doing my master's. So, which also helps pay for your master's too. So. <laughs> That's always helpful. Right? Yeah. So I'm a licensed specialist in school psychology and I know that not many people know exactly what that is. Um, but uh, what I do is I work for school districts and right now I'm working for Corpus Christi ISD and I've been there for about four years. But prior to that I worked in a private practice also. Um, but what I do is I complete psychoeducational evaluations for students um, to determine their eligibility for special education services. So I do a lot of different kind of evaluations like for learning disabilities, autism, um, emotional difficulties, and um, intellectual disabilities. So I do a lot of different kinds of testing. My day-to-day -day life is pretty different, so it's, uh, which I like. So it's, you never really know what you're gonna be doing that day. Um, I also consult a lot with teachers and with parents and um, develop behavior plans and help address behavior concerns. Um, I attend a lot of meetings for students and help develop educational plans for them. So most of my days are sitting in what we call ARD meetings, admission review and dismissal committee meetings. And um, so that's kind of my day to day. I um, actually started out in the master's program in clinical psychology and I didn't really know what I wanted to do from there. Um, but in my practicum, um, I 
worked for Dr. Fisher, who's a psychologist in town, and he's um, both a psychologist and a licensed specialist in school psychology. Um, so I kind of got to see both sides of it. Uh, I worked <coughs> privately and got to see how his private office ran, and then also for um, on the school side of things. Um, so I kind of felt like I really liked the school side of things. So um, I decided I was going to take some extra classes, um, uh, the education classes that are required for the degree. Um, so I actually did that after I graduated with my degree. And so I came back non-degree seeking, which was not <laughs> very fun. You know, get no financial aid at that point. But um, I took a couple of education classes and then did my internship with Dr. Fisher as well. And I traveled to Falfurius and Ben Bolt mostly. And I did special education counseling for them and completed evaluations. Um, and then I kind of, uh, in the private practice, was feeling like I was missing out on getting to be more of a part of the planning for the students. So um, I would just hand over my report and kind of be done with it. So I really wanted to kind of be part of a team and really help develop a plan. Um, so that's why I decided to apply for the school district. And it is a very different experience <laughs> than the private practice. Some good things, some not so good things. But that's kind of how I ended up where I am. Um, I ended up where I am because I had always had a student worker position when I was in my undergrad. I worked in what was called the Women's Center, which we don't have anymore, unfortunately. Um, and so when I got into my graduate program, I decided to find a graduate assistant position because I was just so used to that and I wanted to continue that uh, experience of working somewhere on campus. And so there was a graduate assistant position assisting the academic advisor over the Master's of Science in Nursing. Um, and so I started to assist her and she did have to retire for medical reasons. So they said, well, can you do this job while we look for someone? And I said, well, why don't you hire me? And they said, well, we're not sure if you have to have a master's to do this job. And so I checked with some advisors down the hall, and they just had bachelor's. So I said, okay, no, nope, you don't have to have one. And they're like, oh, okay. So I worked for the College of, Science, uh, College of Nursing and Health Sciences uh, for two years as their graduate academic advisor. And I did take some time off to finish up my internship uh, requirements for my master's in counseling because that would have been a bit much to do with two kids at home and a full-time job, um, in my opinion, for, for my stress level. So I took time off to finish that and um, then did that weird stint in teaching because I thought, why not? I, maybe I want to be a teacher. I'm not sure. And I discovered that wasn't for me and then was lucky to have found a, a new advising position open with the College of Education and Human Development in 2012. And so I started with them and uh, was promoted to senior advisor in 2013. And so now that's where I'm at and how I got there. Um, and I'm a supervisor of three full-time staff members in my unit. Um, so along with the actual advising of students, I have that supervisory aspect to it as well and probably pretty soon budgets because there's some shifting and, and things going on with um, where things land and who's responsible for what, so I might get a little bit of budget experience here pretty soon. Not, not anything like millions of dollars, but just a few thousand. I'm sorry, I just... Was that in 2006 that you were in the college? Was I your advisor? I think you were. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought about that. Angela Huddleston, I was Huddleston back then. And yeah. your name seemed very familiar. <laughs> nice to have it come back around. Uh, <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. But no, no, I don't know about that. That's great. Uh, I guess I'm default at last, right? So, um, <laughs> So I, I, a little different, I, I've been a firefighter paramedic for the city of Corpus Christi for 20 years. Um, about two years ago, I was you know, hands-on, responded to calls, worked my, our odd shifts to 2448s. And then um, I was kind of an ambitious guy, so I, I promoted to uh, dread, dreaded administration, right? So now I have to work normal people hours, eight to five, Monday through Friday, or four tens, whatever it is now. 
Um, and it's a different world, right? So, you know, we, I've spent most of my career just uh, on very hands-on, knowing what I'm doing, uh, practical application of, of things, almost like a science field. Um, but, you know, when we're out there, we don't think about oh, who does the, who sets policy and who does the HR functions or those things just really aren't in your mind. Who pays for everything, really? Uh, so uh, I promoted about two years ago, and it was a good, good timing for me because I just finished my bachelor's degree and, and applied for the uh, master's degree program here in administration. So it was, it was great timing for me. So two years ago, I promoted a position where I'm at now. I'm the assistant fire chief in charge of operations. Um, and, and that is pretty much it. It's, it's a good spot to be in for, for someone looking for an MPA degree because it, every aspect of, of administration, and I do a lot of HR, human resource uh, uh, issues, you know, our, our evaluations for the entire field um, on our performance evaluations. I deal with uh, policy setting and, and evaluation on that as well, and how, not just on how we respond to, you know, well, exactly, that's exactly how we respond to rescue or EMS calls or fire suppression safety, those types of policies, but also our personnel policies, our heavy weather policies, who's an essential employee, who has to stay here, who has to, who can leave during a hurricane, those types of things. Uh, and really, I had a big, in budgeting, you know, that was a big surprise for me, uh, was, oh, I've got to deal with that. That was my decision is there, who can purchase what, and who can do that, and how our city government works, and and stuff like that. So that was uh, th those. That was it. Was a big surprise for me, and then, but it was good timing coming into my, my degree plan at that point. You were kind of living it out. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure we'll talk about this later or talk about this now. But uh, it was it was an interesting experience for me because every single class had good practical application and some sort of project that I was doing on for work. So it was, I don't think I actually, I think I had a, not a single class I didn't have a project for that I was, that wasn't real for me at, at, uh, at work. So it was kind of pulling double duties there, almost cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Questions so far? I do have one for or George. Yes. Uh, good. Uh, I did my bachelor's in accounting as well from Dallas. Uh, when you go with a, a degree like accounting, which is which yields to one of the most high-paying jobs, uh, how does the, the transforming into a public university setting, which is you know a non-for-profit uh, area, um, not, not as corporate as accounting promises? Uh, what made, what was your decision making? What what factored in? So definitely big difference between corporate accounting and higher education accounting. Uh, I won't even just, I would separate it from governmental accounting itself because higher education accounting requires knowledge of policy with the education codes, requires all the, uh, what's it called, the, the accounting, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot the name of it, but it's like the, the big uh, regulatory board. Yeah. Yeah. I first, everything, like it, it's a big combination and so when I was working uh, at the bank as a credit analyst for a little while, I saw you know just regular financial statements that you would see in class for you know intermediate one accounting, intermediate two accounting, all those bachelor specific courses. I saw that there, but when I came over to the higher education side, none of that was included in it. Like it, it was a completely different scenario. You know, you've got your revenues, you've got your expenses. While on the public accounting side, it's very simple, easy. On the higher education side, it's a very confusing, jumbled up mess just because uh, the way departments are set up around here, the way it all kind of feeds from the top, and you don't have too much control over what you can do just because, again, we have state money, so the state has to, we have to follow all those guidelines. So it was, it was definitely uh, a change and an adjustment to make try to understand it all. Uh, thankfully, there are more than enough references out there to read, and that, that's one thing that I think master's uh, classes helped me with, uh, just, just going out and finding that information for myself and just learning it and making sure that I'm applying it correctly. Because when you're in your full-time job, you don't want to make a mistake that's going to end up costing you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, and you're like, oh, yeah, sorry about that. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's very important to to get that knowledge going. Thank you. So, 
when you think about, and, and you started to address this a bit when you were talking about your master's experience, what other kinds of things did you learn in graduate school or experience in graduate school that you thought were really good for you? Are there things you wish you had participated in and didn't, or things you did participate in and thought were way absolutely worth your time, like your courses, which you were? I'll say one of the biggest things for me, I think, was making friends with my cohort uh, in grad school because they're forever kind of my references. So if I am having my time even out at work and I need to consult with someone or I'm having trouble with a hard case and there's someone I need to call, it's still my friends that I made in grad school from studying together and spending so much time together that I call um, to get that second opinion from. So that to me was really important, just that building those relationships and not studying on your own necessarily, but being in groups and forming those connections. Um, I think that was really beneficial for me. And something you've taken with you. Yes, yeah. definitely. And I think that was the challenge for me because I was all online. Oh, right. So it was hard to make those connections with other students. And so the thing that I wish that I had done, because um, I did live in Corpus Christi, I wish I had had more of a presence on camp, like came to campus more. I didn't even know Rex Sports existed, you know, <laughs> until I worked here, you know? <laughs> so it was those kind of things that I, I think I missed some of those connections. But to say that we've improved though, the technology has gotten so much better with the web access and all that kind of stuff that distance education has come a really long way with being able to have those connections now. But I think that, um, if, you know, I know a lot of students out there are, are not local, but if you're ever in Corpus Christi to, to come to campus and take advantage of the resources, especially the new resources with them, y'all have, I forget what it's called, but it's support for graduate students where they get emails and that kind of stuff, right? and or, um, happy birthday even, you know. <laughs> so that, I think, is a really cool thing that, that the graduate school does for students to support them to be connected to the university. I, I wish, to, oh, sorry. That's okay. You first. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, one thing, and it wouldn't apply to my job right now, but I would still have liked to have gone to some of the grant writing workshops that were put on because... Grant writing is in so many fields. My husband's a firefighter. He's writing grants. That's true. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, you're writing grants? I, this is beyond me why you're writing grants. But they that's how they get a lot of their funding. So um, just having that knowledge base, whether or not it, you think it will ever benefit you, if there's something going on with, with the seminars and the workshops, a topic that you're like, well, I don't know if I'll ever use that, just go. Because there could be an opportunity someday down the line where you're going to tap into that uh, knowledge. So I would say that's something I missed out on not taking the time to go to those workshops. That's absolutely right. I took a grant writing uh, class and I did write a grant for my job. So it was good to, uh, that is pretty important to get yourself active and those. And I had, you know, talking about having other students and, and meeting cohorts and that interaction with professors is also very important. Yeah. My bachelor's was online. Uh, and uh, so it was important that I, I kind of wanted, I missed that interaction. Um, uh, you know, just that brick and mortar feeling, it, 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 it's, it's different. Um, so my, my master's was brick and mortar here um, three days a week, and uh, my bachelor's was online. But there are ways to take advantage of those if you're out online. You know, I did a, uh, my bachelor's was with West Texas A&M. And it's a little much, a nine hour drive for me from there. But there are programs too. They did, I did a study abroad with, um, my uh, um, my fellow students there with uh, the, my professor that was in emergency management and that was the best thing I did because we had that one that face to face just that once or twice it does make your online learning a little different so if someone is local yeah come meet your professors <coughs> and just have just have that something about having that face in that that previous contact that makes things a little bit easier. I think touching on what you said earlier too is that uh, I think the research aspect of grad school really helped me because I mean you're writing a ton of well, at least I was writing a ton of research papers and a lot of writing 
and um, just knowing how to go out and find information when you don't know something because there is always something you don't know on the job. There's always new things coming up that you don't know how to deal with. So just th that knowledge of knowing how to go out and find the information you need, I think was really something I learned in grad school too. Yeah, that was for me for sure. That's and learned anything from grad school, it was where to find information and where, how to be self-sufficient about it, uh, who to rely on, you know, how you were saying with the, the uh, getting people together and having like a sort of uh, study group, that also really helped a lot in tracking down information, because a lot of the Masters in Business classes were very, you had to be self-sufficient. The professor gave you a small direction of where he wanted you to take it, but you had to run with it. Especially a, a class like marketing, where it's very different from one person to the next. It's subjective to the person. So he gave you a small idea, you ran with it. Hopefully, it was logical enough that he gave you an A. And that that's really yes, that was definitely a big difference from grad school. Is it's kind of like whatever you put into it is what you get out of it. That's very um, yeah. You have to be self sufficient. <laughs> Self-sufficiency was, was a little different for me, though, uh, because ours was more, uh, in, in, in public administration, we rarely do things as an individual effort, and so ours was more geared towards, and this is very frustrating, group projects. <laughs> <laughs> it, really, it really taught you how to work as a team, whether or not that was their most desirable team or it was, it was your nightmare team. You still had to find a way to work with others, and in government, that is what you are. You can't pick your team, it is it is who it is, and and, and I, I certainly agree. Research was a big part of it. Uh, you know, I guess finding the answers, you need to find the answers, but um, in, in an administration, public administration type uh, field, working as a team, when you can't pick your team, is, is probably one of the biggest lessons you need to, to learn. As a faculty member here, um, and I teach graduate classes, I um, find deciding on a balance of team work and individual work is a part of what I have to think about. And I know that I have students that really dislike working in groups. I know that sometimes groups don't work well. And sometimes they do. Um, but what you're telling us now is good, better, and different. Yeah. You're going to have to do it when you get out of here, so learn how to do it now. Is that? Yep, yeah. that's yeah. Really yeah. my job too. It's exactly like that. You never know what teacher or parent you're going to be sitting with, but you need to all come together and agree on something. So, so right, as faculty here too, I struggle with that question as well. But having been through it, yeah, we hated it, probably, most of us. <laughs> but it was really worthwhile skill to learn how to negotiate in a group environment. And anywhere you go, no matter where you are, if you're at a faculty meeting, you're on a team. If you're, on a, if you're nursing, a staff nurse, on a unit, you're on a team. And if, if team functioning doesn't work on a unit, then things go bad pretty fast. So it's really important practical skill to learn to be able to function in any group that you're put in. So what tips, I wonder, do you have for people who are trying to, maybe they're on a not so great team in one of their classes, what tips do you have for helping them learn from that experience or learn how to navigate teams not of choice? Yeah. You know, I'm not a psychologist or have any of that. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, I've worked with as, as a team um, in many different areas for, for the last 20 years. You know. um, so the, the biggest thing, just drawn from that experience, is, is mainly is if you have the time. Sometimes we have to have a strong leader, depending on the time frame and time schedule and environment you're in. But assuming we have the time and and the patience. Uh, is basically just listening, is getting everybody's input and making sure we really are listening and that uh, they are truly having their input. That's probably all that's one. But listening, having have everybody have a chance to provide their input and be heard. 100% agree. I think that that's mostly 
especially because I deal a lot of times with parents who are upset or teachers who are upset about a situation, and that's basically what they want is they just want someone to listen to them. So I think that's a big part of it, just making sure everyone has an input and you're, that everyone is considering everyone else's input, which is a hard thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll say my tendency in group projects was to take things over, but, but, I, <laughs> but what I found in my job is I can't take it all over. There is no way I could get my job done if I was the only one doing it. I, I mean, it's just too much. So I, learning to give up some things. Compromise. Too. Oh, yes. The art of compromise. Yes. Right? yes, I would also address the natural born leader person in groups. Like, you can't do it all. And yeah. you will have to learn that either now or down the road that delegation is actually a really good thing to embrace mm -hmm. and trusting others, to, even if they haven't proven maybe that they should be trusted, but just go with your with that and try to trust them to do their part and it will serve you better in the long run. I'd say having a... The, when you're working a team, everybody needs to have the same objective. Because at the end of the day, what, what, are you, what are you trying to accomplish? If somebody is focusing on a completely different uh, finish line than you are, then you're going to butt heads. You're going to be wondering, why haven't they done their part? Why am I doing all this work and they're not really even looking at the same thing I am? So I think uh, having that same uh, end goal is what's something that's really important to teamwork. Everybody has their clear expectations, right? Correct. That's, that's, that's right. So what other things do you think graduate students could stand to pay attention to? Maybe other than the knowledge base, obviously, in their disciplines. I think one of the biggest things for me, too, was just learning how to manage stress and a lot the big workload when you have a lot of classes and you're writing a lot of papers and stress is a big part of my job I'm sure it is everyone's yeah. but um, it's oh, you tend to be overworked and, and at least in the education world we're usually understaffed so um, you're spending a lot of time meeting a lot of deadlines so um, that was I think helpful for me for grad school to kind of learn to manage my time and to also remind myself to take the time I need to regroup if it um, mm -hmm. if I'm having a hard time and feeling overstressed just taking some time to relax a little bit and get back and I think grad school helped me do that too I needed to remember that wasn't the only part of my life <laughs> right and I think that this thing is like I think um, along those same lines, um, learning how to say no, mm -hmm. because um, you know when we're in working on our graduate school, every, we work full time. Most graduate students work full time. I work full time the whole time. And then when I was working on my PhD, I worked full time as a teacher, and I also worked in the hospital as a staff nurse because I didn't want to give it up. But I got to the point where I was starting my dissertation and I had something had to go. So you have to get realize at what point, when does something have to go and what is your future tra trajectory gonna be? Is it this current job right now or is it your future job down the road? So that was a challenge for me to do. It was really hard to leave the bedside, but, but it was a decision I had to make so that I could get my PhD and you know go along the trajectory that I had chosen for myself. So um, that whole time I was faculty here as well and you know, when you're faculty here, people ask you to do things like this, which I love doing, but I had to learn to, while I was in graduate school to say no. And it's hard, it's hard to do, yeah. but, but it's something that is important for your success too. Yeah, I, I think that would probably be for all of our, you know, anybody in grad school and full-time job, um, or even if you're only part-time, it still takes up the majority of your time. And, Time management. I'm a procrastinator. I know it. You too. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I had to recognize that myself and and, and procrastinate only as long as I actually could. Mm -hmm. um, I just think I prioritize things. I'm a, I'm a big prioritizer. Yeah, yeah, I can wait. Right. 
Um, but time management and, and, and knowing knowing yourself and making those adjustments that need to be done. I did have to drop a few things on her and say, no, yeah, I can say that's that's a for sure thing. Um, but yeah, time management, but it's not academic. But research, proper research methods, I think, is, is, is also a good one. I, I thought I was making a mistake by taking research methods my first semester, but it was actually very, very good choice because everything else built from that, at least on administration. Say having a, a support network and if you don't feel like you have one um, like our provost says find your tribe <laughs> um, so I think if, if you don't have maybe the family support or something like that then like you had said make some friends in your program and, and lean on each other because there's going to be times where you want to give up and just throw down the books and say, I'm going to just walk away from this whole thing. And I, as an advisor, I've actually seen students with two classes left walk away um, because life can get difficult. Um, so try to find those resources and, and people that can help you during those tough times. I'd say a little bit different from that is have fun with it. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. I mean, oh, you're, you're here. You're here already, might as well make the most of it. Uh, meeting people, you know, hanging around the campus, there's always events going on. Free food at different places. I think there's some here as well, so <laughs> you back. So uh, that, that's, a, that's another big thing, just have fun with it. You're, you're here, make the most of it. So we, we're running quickly out of time, so Questions you have for any or all of our panel? Things you might be curious about. Thanks. I do have a question, but I, it may not be a very um, short question to answer. Is um, asking for myself and also a lot of other graduate students that I meet in Growth Suite is that they are constantly, or we are constantly worrying about where do we get those jobs? Like, how can we transition from a student? to um, a job seeker, what are the things that we need to be sure that we're doing so that we can get a job, if that makes sense? I think getting to know your faculty really well is a big help because they're the ones who know where the jobs are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And they're the ones, they get to know you pretty well and they, I don't know what your major is, but for me in nursing, I got to know the faculty pretty well and look where I work. Okay, okay. So, so I think that's kind of an important thing too, is to get to know your faculty, let them get to know you, and really start that communication with them about, okay, what, where do you think I fit with my master's degree? Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I don't know if it's like this program, but um, in our program we needed, we had to do a practicum, mm -hmm. so that's when I worked for Dr. Fisher, and I think just taking that practicum very seriously and really throwing yourself into it, that's where I ended up with a job after. So if you are serious about your practicum and showing that, if that's part of your program, then I think there are people out there who will scoop you up if they see that you're doing a good job in your practicum. So that was how I got a job. I think there's several ways, you know, for, for public administration, and I've seen several that work with the city and city hall that have taken advantage of internships. Mm -hmm. So if you have if internships within your program, for sure take advantage of one of those because there are numerous, at least in, in, in work with the city, that started out there as interns. And, and more than likely, you do a good job as an intern, you get your mm -hmm. you get your graduate degree, you probably have a job waiting for you over there. So that's a good one. The other one is networking, and this is something I try to get other people to do as well. There are, there are many groups um, even within Corpus Christi, that uh, cater, that cater, but the kind of specific age groups. There's a group for you. Um, I'm involved in, in several networking groups, or just civic groups like Rotary and and uh, Leadership Corpus Christi. Um, uh, so I, I was I'm in those, but there's also um, uh, Oh my gosh, it's the business young uh, he's gonna professional. Yes, he's gonna kill me, I didn't get that right. <laughs> young business group at YBP. You know, that's an awesome uh, group to be to be part of because there is so much networking there as well. 
So just getting to know as many people as you can, mm -hmm. those opportunities pop up all over the place, and there's not just one one catch-all that, that you can go find a job. But internships, networking, just getting to know people, and then your own research. But essentially, yeah, that that's how it worked for me. You know, the the networking aspect of it. Uh, I am involved in a young business professionals actually. Oh, well, we have a meeting today after this. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but getting to know those what's around you because there might in these groups there might be people who are already employed with somebody and they're they're looking for somebody else and how else are you going to learn about it if you're not there mm -hmm. and i think that could actually also also help you uh as we talked about we uh, talked about before with uh, uh your time management and, and uh, having fun because that way you're, you're meeting people you're getting out there, you're putting yourself out there. However, though, I did get the bank job that I had for a little while from a career fair that we hosted here. Oh. And uh, that, that is another avenue. I, I came prepared, came with resumes, came with a cover letter, came with a suit on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I put, told them, hey, I want a job. You know, I, I wanted to get on out there after I got my bachelor's. And that, that also, I think, helped uh, yeah. a ton. And all, I think also, again, back to networking with your cohort, because how I got my job with Corpus Christi ISD is one of my fellow grad students was already or that I was in grad school with was already working there, and she put in a good work for me, and so that's how I got a job there. So I think just networking with everyone. <laughs> yeah. And take risks. Like, don't be afraid to apply for a job and see if it works out. And, or, like me, just... Well, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, it can work. I mean, you never know um, the opportunities that are out there unless you go for them. Um, and I know that I'm not in the traditional field that counselors are in, but my dad did have an experience with his internship, plugging him into um, into good opportunities um, because through his internship, then he was able to establish his um, his own private practice is what he's doing now and they already knew him from his time when he worked at Bayview and at Memorial Hospital and so it was like oh of course we're going to send this person that's discharging to, to Mike so um, there's a lot of opportunities again if you take take those opportunities if you just let them pass by then maybe it's not going to work out but just put yourself out there and, and be prepared because once it comes it just then it just goes and, you have it. It's really neat. So you'll to, get there. To add to that, I mean, with, with being prepared, you want to have a, a resume that's that's yes. ready, good, and ready to go. Don't just go on Google and <laughs> search for resume <laughs> formats and then just fill that out. No, like actually try to get it reviewed by a professor, get it reviewed by your peers, your mom, your dad, your <laughs> uncles, a career counselor. A career counselor. <laughs> that you, that you I simply use my career counselor. Yeah. And, and, because that resume is going to be the first thing that that employer is going to see uh, of you. If you, you know, a couple of misspelled words here and there, do make an impression. They definitely do make an impression. So, I think that's the, one of the first steps is making sure you have that ready, good and ready to go. Yeah, I I can speak to that. I've been on 21 hiring committees in my time here. <laughs> so having a good resume and a cover letter that is not a generic cover letter is important too because when we we get cover letters that say I'm applying for a job in this other completely other institution but it was for here at and Corbin it's like mm -hmm. hey. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah and we, we do have a great career services office um, like I said I still when I applied to my ADD program tapped into my career counselor and she never says no she probably should but she never says no and always reviews it for me and makes it look nice and gives me suggestions. So uh, that, tap into that resource for sure. Yeah, even at the, when people are hiring for faculty, we get some of those sometimes where there's a generic letter and they forgot to change the name of the university or the department or something like that. And I, I just want to reinforce what all of you have been saying because if the material comes in sloppy or looking like you haven't spent any time or learned anything about the company or the institution, 
you don't set yourself up to be one of the, oh, I want to interview them people. So learn what you can about where you're trying to apply. That's, that's, a, that's a really important, I know that's part of the interview process after you find a job you want, but yes, know a little bit about what you're, what the, the company you're interviewing for is, because they will ask you what you know about them. Mm -hmm. Other questions? What are you going to regret not asking them when this is over? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to wish you had asked one of these folks? Parting words from you, things that you would really like them to know. Take an opportunity, take all opportunities as a chance to evolve your life. Don't just see it as the present, look to the future and really uh, help put yourself up for success. I would say every project you do, everything you do in your classes, just put all that you can into it and think of it as not just a grade to get, but as that's what you're going to be doing in the future. Right. So really going with a mindset of that into your graduate work, that this is preparing you for your job later. I think that's really important. Let your work ethic in school and in your internship sites and anywhere you do become employed, let that work ethic speak to you and the education that you receive. Because um, I think that goes a long way in, in advancing and in just really enjoying your job. I, I have some advice, I guess, and I'd like to address my fellow panel members, too. Don't stop. If you have an interest at all in doing research at all, go for the PhD. It, I just got mine in December, and it has opened so many doors for me, I can't even believe it, okay? So really consider if your degree path has a PhD, if it's... If, if it hasn't, look for it, especially if you're interested in doing research with your future trajectory, okay? I know it's a little overwhelming right now to think about it because you're working on your master's right now, but don't stop. It, it, it's been just so rewarding to have done that. It, yeah, it takes a long time. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's been worth every cent, every penny. It's been an investment in myself, and that's, that would be a recommendation for your future. And y'all too. I, want, I, want to, I actually I stayed an extra semester to write a thesis, even though it wasn't necessarily a requirement for a program. And I am so glad that I did that, even though it maybe isn't going to go anywhere from there. But it, just having that experience was really helpful for me too. Getting the research experience and just it's kind of a whole different world that you don't really get much in in undergraduate. So. And if you ever decide it, you know, 15 years from now, exactly. you want to get a doctor, exactly. it'll work to your benefit mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I ask a Bama question? Is that okay? I just wanted to know what, what your disciplines are. Where are you getting your master's in? What are you working on? Accounting. Accounting? Yeah. Okay. Accounting. Accounting. Okay. Any, is there, were there any others? Uh, uh, I'm doing my EDD in educational leadership. Oh, good. Good, for good for you. I'm in counseling. Okay. Masters. I'm also um, in counseling, but it's a um, doctoral um, program. Really? Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. What about you? I think he said it. Oh, he already said it. Okay. I missed that some. Last I am doing a master's in public administration. Ooh. Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> I, um, I already finished my master's in business administration. And she's our student. She works with us. Okay. Uh, Welcome. You're doing uh, <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Pre professional track? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going biological science and in psychology and I'm concentrating in science. So it's going to take a little while. Wow. Yeah.
<laughs> busy. Yeah. Busy. So what I'm going to invite you, thank you again for doing this and for letting us record it so that we can put your words of wisdom online for our students. Um, 